Welcome back to the brew side of the house. It's been a while, but today's segment is going to talk about chilling the wart, uh, which is a big thing here in Florida, where after coming from Seattle, where we had nice cold tap water all the time, wart chilling was easy. Here, especially in the summertime, tap water can be 80 degrees or more, and so you've got to pre-chill it and uh, use some uh, some more techniques to get the tap the wart down to the temperature that you want it to be. Here's our setup. We have a pre-chiller that's inside of an igloo container and it comes off the tap. The water is filtered coming off of the tap and then uh, goes through a, um, a coil type copper chiller that'll be immersed in ice in the igloo container and then off to a Blickman Therminator which does a good job of uh, transferring the heat from the wart out to the tap water. Connecting the supply and return lines to the uh, Therminator right now and making sure everything is nice and tight so we don't have leaks. The pump is down on the bottom of the table in the background there and so I'm going to finish hooking up the uh, adapter lines. I use mostly stainless steel quick connect settings in my brewery uh, just easy to move the hoses around and that's the discharge from the pump now going onto the wart inlet on the Therminator. We'll take the outlet side and uh, clamp it onto the uh, connector and that goes straight into the fermenter and I'm lucky enough to have a couple of uh, the nice Blickman stainless steel conicals. You'll see one here in a minute. And with that, we can keep the entire loop airtight. Uh, nothing gets exposed to the atmosphere. Uh, place the Blickman with the arrow pointing up and get ready to start cooling off some chilling water. Uh, put three or four bags of ice in there. That usually does the trick. And uh, sometimes I buy ice. I have a refrigerator in the garage with an ice maker. So if I save it up, I can just use my own ice and that saves a little bit of money too. Quick tip, when you start putting the ice in the cooler, make sure you have the tap water flowing because I froze that thing solid one time and it took me like an hour to get it thawed out and it was a mess because I had to take it out of the ice. So uh, learn from my, um, my mistakes. Here's a quick rundown of the water flow. It's gonna come out of the tap. You can see the filter there in the background. It goes through my uh, little piece of garden hose and into the coil chiller covered in ice inside the igloo container comes back out of that. Now that water is going to be nice and cold just because it spends so much time in the ice. Going to come back down and um, into the, the black and yes that's a washing machine hose. I'm, uh, I'm not ashamed to say that's what I use to connect over to the plate chiller. Um, into the plate chiller uh, has chilled water inlet and outlet. It's counterflow plate chiller so the uh, just flows in the opposite direction and there's a ton of surface area inside those plates to uh, transfer heat. It does a really good job. Uh, you know it's working well when the temperature of the return line is warm, uh, sometimes really hot. And you can see, yep, it's nice and warm right now. I put a little piece of copper tubing on the end there, so when I clamp it to the sink like that, it doesn't kink the hose shut. Uh, Learn that the hard way, too, so don't make my mistakes again. Um, we have a pump, so it really helps. Uh, one of the greatest upgrades I ever made was having a pump. And so my goal here is to keep it as hot as possible and not drop the lid and uh, go from the uh, kettle all the way into the fermenter without that wart ever seeing the light of day. So it'll come off of the, uh, uh, the boil kettle and eventually end up over there. Now I'm doing the thing that I forgot to do in the past, which is open the valves on the kettle and the fermenter uh, with my silicon hose. If you forget to do that, it's very easy to overpressurize and in fact explode the hose. Uh, I did that one time and man oh man, I can only tell you that was not a fun thing to clean up at all. Let me take a look at uh, the whole setup here and you can see this is what it looks like as we do business. Now I'm opening up the, um, the valve, the outlet valve of the pump and it's a centrifugal pump and so it needs to not have any air in it. It'll get air bound pretty easily. And so what I do normally is I take the discharge hose and I just hold it up like that in the air and let all the air bubbles come out. And you know that you have them out when you see the, it's self-leveling now because there's no air in the line. So that level in the hose will be the, the same as the level in the boil kettle. Move it up and down a few times. And uh, also you can see the hose on the inlet side of the pump especially has no bubbles in it anymore. And so we're ready to pump. And then uh, throttle down that discharge valve on the pump to give you a nice low flow rate, especially in the beginning. And you can see it's starting to flow. Goes through the uh, temperature indicator there on the outlet so I know exactly what temperature is going into the fermenter. And if you look at the top of the fermenter, you can see the airlock bubbling. That's positive indication that you have flow into the fermenter, so you know everything's good. You also know that your fermenter is airtight, and that's a good thing to know. Here's what the flow looks like through the system. Starting the boil kettle, you can see 
Um, it's 210 degrees. That's nice. Uh, warm enough to not have to worry about anything getting introduced. See the discharge valve on the pump is just slightly cracked open. You have a pretty low flow rate. I found it's about one gallon per minute or so because it takes about 10 minutes to fill up the fermenter. Inlet and outlet of the fermenter counter flowing to the uh, tap water that's cooling and there's the temperature indicator. 68 degrees right now. That's wonderful. And then at this point, once you have an airtight system and everything is flowing, um, it's simply a matter of regulating the temperature by adjusting the outlet valve on the pump. And here's how we control the flow. Right now it's a little bit too cold and so it's indicating low off the scale. And you just, that, that's a solid block of aluminum on that, um, I think it's called the, I forget what, they, what Blickman calls this device, but the temperature indicator. Um, you can just touch it and feel that it's really cold so you know it's not off the scale high, it'd be really warm. And so there's just starting to appear on 58 now and when the temperature is changing rapidly you have to watch carefully because if it is too hot it'll go all the way across the scale before you even know it so you can see it now at 62 and i want to i like to anywhere between 65 and 70 is where i like to have it going into the fermenter for most of the ales that i make and so when it gets up to about 70 then i'm going to throttle down on the flow shut the discharge valve just a little bit um, on the pump to slow that flow down when it slows down, then it's going to spend a little more time in the chiller, get a little bit colder, and that'll bring the temperature back under control. <clears throat> Here's my valve. Now, this is just a regular ball valve that I'm using for throttling, and um, honestly, that's not ideal. I think in the long run, I'd like to try a needle valve or some other kind of globe valve that would give me a better throttling characteristics. Uh, the biggest challenge I face is that it just takes very little uh, change in the position of the valve handle to cause a big change in the difference of flow going through the pump. And I'll be down there a lot of times moving it tiny little bits with my foot while I'm bending over the other way to look at the temperature. Anyhow, that's how we do it. Um, please let us know what you think. I'd love to hear your ideas.